Good morning and welcome to St. John's Presbyterian Church in Toronto. Today is uh, Sunday, January 16th, 2022, <coughs> and we are delighted to be here with a few of us in person, uh, some of us online, and some of us will be watching afterwards. This morning, uh, we're always thrilled when we have the Reverend Dr. Charlotte Stewart leading us in worship, and we're delighted to have with us Mrs. Grace Hahn, our minister and associate, our music director, <laughs> playing the organ. We, uh, we're without a singer this morning. Uh, this is uh, just one of those things that happens during COVID where people sometimes can't uh, come out in person. <coughs> and um, uh, for anybody watching online afterwards, if you don't know me, I'm the Reverend Maureen Walter. A few announcements this morning before I turn the service over to Charlotte. Uh, we uh, have set our annual general meeting for uh, Sunday, February the 27th at 3 p.m. We're going to do that meeting by Zoom like we did last year, um, and we hope that all of you can attend. Any of you who are not um, uh, receiving if you're watching online somehow and you're not receiving our emails, you can contact the church website and we will email you uh, all notices and links to our meetings and our services. But with the annual meeting comes the need to prepare an annual report. If you are involved in any of our activities, and we know everything is so steeply limited with um, uh, COVID, uh, another full year of it, uh, please send your annual report, whatever it might be, to Lori McGugan, and we're hoping to get those to her by January 30th to give her the time to prepare our annual report. We will be continuing with our online Bible study Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m., and again, those uh, Zoom invites go out um, to your email addresses. A special service coming up next Sunday afternoon, uh, January 23rd at 4 p.m. is the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity Service. That is a service which uh, is done under the auspices of the Canadian Council of Churches, in fact, the World Council of Churches, and it's always in preparation for many months. Uh, again, because of the um, high cases of Omicron, what we are going to try to do is have the participating clergy, some representatives of the choir will be in person at the Holy Trinity Armenian Apostolic Orthodox Church on Progress Avenue. But uh, we are encouraging people whenever possible to join the service on Zoom. Uh, it is a large church, so if there are a few uh, people there in person, they will be able to socially distance and mask and so on. Uh, we, we do hope that uh, some of us will be able to join that service and that um, information went out this week. Um, and thank you as always to those of you who've continued to support us financially throughout COVID. It has allowed us to carry on and we're deeply grateful. All offerings can either be brought to the church, mailed to the church, or you can contact our treasurer uh, to organize our pre-authorized remittance or electronic transfer of funds. Those are our announcements today. Um, we acknowledge that St. John's Presbyterian Church, part of the Presbytery of East Toronto, worships and meets on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. We understand that this land was very important for indigenous people who lived on it before us, that this land is still important for Indigenous people today and that Indigenous ways of living with each other and their ways of relating to the Creator have always been connected to this land and its creatures. Thank you.
worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, bow down in reverence, God's glory proclaim. That's a call to worship, but I would like to read some of my favorite phrases from the hymn that Grace is now going to uh, play. Mornings of joy give for evenings of tearfulness, trust for our trembling, and hope for our fear. Grace is going to play hymn 174, Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, creator and renewer of all that is, we praise you for the gifts that you have showered upon us. We praise you for the beauty we see all around us for the infinite variety of your creation and for the unexpected and the surprising which add richness to our daily life. We praise you for your love which sustains and renews us and we offer you our worship and our love this morning in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord God, we know that you offer us new life in Christ, but still we shut your spirit out of our hearts and out of our lives. We have tried to live in our own way, tried to live in our own strength. We have strayed far away from the paths that you want us to tread. Forgive us. Take our failures, our half-hearted efforts, and our selfish prayers, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, transform our insipid lives into the rich new wine of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now let each one of us accept God's forgiveness. Let each one of us feel the burden of guilt lifted from our shoulders, our hearts, and our minds. And let us continue to worship God freely. Amen. Reading the first uh, 10 verses of Psalm number 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear 
and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord who answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to God and be radiant so your faces shall never be ashamed. The poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear God and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who take refuge in God. Now, Phyllis Anderson and Nancy Stevenson are going to read the epistle and the gospel respectively. Good morning. The first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> it's concerning the spiritual gifts. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same spirit to another faith, by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. The end of the epistle. Good morning. Our scripture lesson today is the wedding of Cana, and it's taken from St. John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? The hour has not yet come. 
his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there a few days. Amen. <clears throat> In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. John's Gospel is one of signs. It's well known, those of you who have been in Bible studies or heard sermons, that that is what John's Gospel is recognized as being. I remember a book that was Called, the title of which was The Seven Signs of John's Gospel. Signs they are that point us to who Jesus really is. And yet, and yet this account of Jesus' first sign that Nancy read just now to us, his first recorded miracle, has in my opinion, been the basis for so many misinterpretations. I kid you not, I recall hearing one preacher within his sermon say something like this. In Cana, everyone was having a good time at the wedding banquet. There was music and there was dancing. It was a hot day, people got thirsty, and they ran out of wine. Everyone began to get sad, he said. But Jesus didn't want that to happen. Rather, he wanted a celebration. So voila, Jesus turned water into wine, and the party continued. After all, claimed the preacher, Jesus loves a good party. My uh, homiletics professor would have had a great time critiquing the core of that particular sermon. But you know, that preacher, and even some of us, might like to believe that Jesus is a party animal. But let us not use this text to support that belief. For there's no hint at Cana, as John tells the story, that Jesus was a party animal. Just read the dialogue between him and his mother. I also remember reading about a Bible study group discussing the wedding at Cana when someone within the group said, 
And you know, if you're leading a Bible study group, Maureen knows this, you've, to, you've just to hold your breath and let people say what they want to say. But this person said, oh, I think it's a wonderful tale of how Jesus overcame his initial hesitation to do the right thing. Think about it. The bride and groom must have been so embarrassed. The party had gotten out of hand, and worst of all, the caterers ran out of Zinfandel and Chablis. At that point, reading this little story, I realized the Bible study was happening in California. The person went on and said, it must have been awful, but Jesus was there, and he produced some wine and saved the hosts from what would have been a disaster. That too is an interesting view of the wedding at Cana. However, the Jesus portrayed by John is not a bit interested in saving people from social miscues. Indeed, he seems totally unconcerned about etiquette. Why? He took the jars normally used for Jewish purification rituals and made them carafes of new wine. Those actions are not the actions of someone concerned about social appropriateness. So let's look at the facts. The signs, as demonstrated by John. The first thing we should note is that John's gospel takes its shape from a sense of signs, from a series of signs, all revealing Jesus as the Messiah, all revealing Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And this is the first of these signs. The text is full of clues leading up to the major sign. We're told there was a wedding, a wedding in Cana. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and the disciples had also been invited. They ran out of wine. And it's the mother who sees fit to tell Jesus. The exchange between Jesus and his mother is full of hints, full of signs, full of innuendo. Clearly, she's not saying all lightheartedly or in a gossipy tone. Imagine that. They've run out of wine, Jesus, my son. I imagine her eyes boring into his. And his reply, though it may seem like a, a brush off, or impolite even, makes it clear that he knows, that she knows who he is and what he is capable of doing. What concerns that of mine, he says to her? What's that got to do with me? And when she looks with maternal pressure, he adds, my hour has not yet come. It is so difficult to handle this story 
without it slipping out of our hands. What's going on here, really? Is it a story about a wedding? I don't think so. No, I think this is a story about a, an uncommon wedding guest named Jesus Christ. So let's look at the clues that we have to help us understand this story. The first is this, that Jesus used a village feast not as an opportunity to make people happy, but as an opportunity to reveal God to the people. John says this was the first time Jesus revealed God's glory. And as is always the case, some people miss the point entirely. Jesus stood before them with the power to turn water into wine, and those who actually witnessed what happened could only comment on the quality of the wine. And the caterer was one of them. Oh, how he missed the point. All he could comment on was that the hosts had abandoned the long-held practice of waiting until people's taste buds had been dulled by good wine before producing inferior wine, which they wouldn't then notice. You've saved the best until the last, he said, completely missing the point. But then who can blame him? Who can blame him? For Jesus revealed the glory of God not in high and lofty places, but in the middle of a wedding celebration. He revealed the glory of God not in the reverent hush of a sanctuary, but at a neighborhood party. God drew near amidst loud music. And that, after all, is the central theme of John's Gospel. Where do we find the fullness of God's glory? Not in the dead rituals of lofty traditions or even organized religion, but in a specific human person, Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal word become flesh. And knowing this does more than make people happy. It satisfies the deepest longings of the human heart. And that brings us to the second clue in the story. If the human Jesus is to reveal the everlasting God, then some established, long-held customs are going to have to be broken. At Cana, Jesus uses six large stone jars as carafes for new wine. Those jars were usually filled with water for purification ceremonies, for the ritual of cleansing dirty hands. Jesus claimed the authority to break the rules put those jars to another use. For those who knew what he was doing, this action was disturbing, to say the least. Imagine the baptismal font 
becoming a punch bowl. But there's no telling what rules with a capital R Jesus will break in order to disclose the presence, the power, the glory of God. If you read John's Gospel, you get the clear impression that whatever happened at Cana can happen anywhere, anywhere, and at any time. With Jesus around, every day is the third day when this wedding, John says, happened. If we have eyes to perceive them, we see minor miracles every day. Significant transformations that happen in your life and in mine and in the life of our neighbors and our family members. And they are no less far-reaching than what happened at Cana. At any given moment, a sign from, from heaven can redirect you or you, or me, can turn me around, can prompt us to participate in God's timetable for the world, where every day is the third day, the day of resurrection, the day of new life for all. And it can be so disruptive, so disruptive. For one of the things that God has been trying to teach me all my life is that we are going to become new creations in Christ. And when we do, then we will have to let go of all patterns old habits, comfortable habits, familiar ways. Because, you see, the work of Jesus is always, always about making something new, about beginning over again, about establishing new relationships, about making a new start every day. And such, such changes can be disruptive. And all of this points to the third and the last clue about this first sign. When new life comes, when new wine is poured, it is the gift of Jesus Christ. He alone chooses to give the new wine. No one, not even his mother, can force him to give it. In the Gospel of John, no one can tell Jesus what to do. He always acts intentionally and deliberately. For he is the Lord, and he comes to show us what God is like. One theologian has said, in the Cana story, Jesus meets the immediate need, but he does more. Compassion alone might provide wine, but sovereign grace does more. It reveals God in what is done. 
On the third day, Jesus turned water into wine. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. And if every day is the third day, then there's no telling what the risen Christ may do among us as he comes in the wild, unpredictable grace of God. Open yourself to that unpredictable coming. Amen. Grace is uh, going to play uh, hymn number 172, As With Gladness, Men of Old. For any who are visiting with us today, during COVID, it has not been our habit to carry the um, offering plate around. So if you happen to have an offering which you are uh, anxious to present to God, at the end of the service, the offering plate's there. You'll see that some regulars have already put theirs in the offering. And we give thanks for, as Maureen said, the generosity and uh, faithfulness of people during this time in the giving of their offerings. Let us pray. Let us, each one in silence, give thanks to God for all the things in our individual lives that we so often take for granted. Especially let us give thanks for those people who each day touch our lives and offer to us love, encouragement, in these times, conversation, a listening ear. And as we offer our prayers of intercession, I thought today we would remember before God work in all its semblances. Lord God, we are so aware during this pandemic of how important some people's work is, of how some people are without work, 
of how some people become so aware of their need to earn money by working. And so we pray for those whose daily work gives them power over other people, for those concerned in any level or any form of government, for those in charge of companies, owners of companies, employers, we pray for the leaders of trade unions and for those whose work influences how we think. We pray for all those that we have come to talk about as frontline workers and take so much for granted. We pray for nurses, doctors, those who keep hospitals and health facilities clean. We pray for emergency workers of any kind, firemen, ambulance drivers, people out on the streets helping those who are homeless and cold. We pray for those whose work is teaching, being within places where people are educated, schools, colleges, universities. And we pray for all the support staff within those buildings, remembering to our children who go back to school tomorrow. Finally, we pray for those who are unable to go about their daily lives and their daily work. We pray for those who are unemployed, for those who are ill, For those who have been injured, especially those who have been injured on the job. And we pray for those who are recently bereaved and whose bereavement causes them to be unable to concentrate on work as such. Lord, you have work for each one of us to do. Teach us, old and young, sick and well, waged and unwaged, academic and laborer, strong and weak, to serve you in all that we do and to realize that we are indeed serving you. Who taught us to pray together saying, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 177, Christ whose glory fills the skies.
this week open to the wild, unpredictable coming of Christ into your life, your ordinary life, your everyday life. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and power of God's Holy Spirit be with you and with all whom you love wherever they are, this day and always. Amen.